title of my lesson this morning is The Holy Spirit and Christmas. Maybe a little different perspective here than what we normally have. Normally we talk about it this time of year. When we think about it, we, we might not at first see the, core, the connection between the two, you know, Holy Spirit and Christmas. Sounds like two different sermons. You know. But hopefully after our lesson this morning, you'll see that uh, there would be no Christmas without the Holy Spirit. There would be no Christmas without the Holy Spirit. Of course, I have one qualifying statement here, and that is when I say Christmas, I, I, I'm not talking to the public holiday, you know, the shopping frenzy, Santa Claus, all that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about today is the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the actual birth of Christ and how this connection brings peace to all men. The same peace is mentioned in both Luke and Paul's writing when discussing this particular event. So we'll start with Luke, the passage just read. When Luke recorded the scene with the shepherds at Jesus' birth, he was referring to the relational peace that Christ was bringing with him, beginning by his physical birth here on earth as a man. And verse 14, chapter two, verse 14, you know where it says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. You know, that particular verse has been so misread to mean things that it doesn't mean at all. For example, some say that it means Jesus' birth brings peace between people and that this explains why there's such a feeling of goodwill at Christmas time. And people misquote by saying, you know, it says peace among men, not between men. You know, words matter, especially in the Bible. Every word given by God, words, even the conjunctions and the prepositions they matter. Peace among men, not peace between men. And another misinterpretation that God is pleased with only some and Jesus was sent for only some. Calvinistic idea that only those chosen by God can be saved and Jesus was only sent to save, to save them. These misinterpretations and misunderstandings have blurred the real meaning of peace that Luke talks about in these particular verses. The peace that the gospel writer refers to is a cessation of hostilities between God and man that have been going on since the beginning of time. From the day Adam sinned by disobeying God's command, all men have been separated and hostile towards God because of their sins. Paul says in Romans 5.12, therefore just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So whether they wish to or not, all men are slaves to sin, separated from God and doomed to be condemned for it at judgment. Wow, what a Christmas sermon you're getting this morning. But what I'm talking about has a whole lot more to do with Christmas than Santa Claus. Listen to what the Bible says. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And in another place, the wage of sin is death. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. And again, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Paul, Romans 7, 14 and 15. Think about it. What a condition, what a predicament to be in. To know that sinning leads to death and condemnation, to actually know it intellectually. But to be powerless to stop sinning, even when knowing the consequences, not being able to stop. It's like being on a runaway train. You know it's going to crash, you know it's going faster. You're on the train, you can't even stop it. 
to know that no matter what, no matter how hard one tried, they would be subject to death and eternal separation from God. In other words, the most enlightened person on earth only realizes that they are doomed as sinners, imagine. What a condition. But then, here's the Christmas part, but then one day a child is born in Bethlehem, a child who has a divine source and a divine mission that John talks about in John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14 and chapter 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What did He do? He sent His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him, what? Will not perish. Whoever believes in Him is able to get off that runaway train. The Son of God comes to this earth born of a human body. His mission is to live a perfect and sinless life and then offer that life as a payment for the moral debt of all mankind from Adam to the very last human being born on this earth before it is destroyed by fire on the last day, 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11. And by doing this, he will, in effect, remove the sins that separate man from God. Okay, watch it, here's the peace part. There is now a way opened up for peace between God and mankind to exist. I mean, there will still be sin and men will still be powerless to completely overcome their sinful natures. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. However, there will now be a payment for those sins. There will now be a continual effective cleansing of sinners through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, oh, this part I love, once and for all. Once and for all. I would so pray and hope that every individual in this room and everyone watching me would press into their heart the words once and for all. It is done and complete. Because of Jesus and what He has done, the thing, the evil, the bad blood, the war between God and man has been removed, cleansed, made right, and God can once again be at peace with man. Now you know why the angels were rejoicing. The angels rejoice in anticipation of what Jesus would ultimately accomplish for man. Peace between man and God. Finally. Why Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so a more accurate reading of Luke would be with whom he is pleased. You could also say with men of good will. The idea is that all those who would seek the good will of God would find the peace that Jesus was sent to establish. And that's something to be happy about. That's something to celebrate. This peace, this relational peace between God and man was available for everybody, but acquired only by those who sought it through Jesus Christ. As Paul says in Ephesians 2.14, for He Himself is our, is our peace. So that's the, that's the peace in Luke. Now Paul talks about peace as well. If you have your Bibles, open up to uh, Galatians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Galatians uh, chapter, um, chapter five. <clears throat> Excuse me. Familiar passage. Paul says in Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two. He says, "But the fruit of the store, uh, the fruit of the spirit, is love, joy, peace." Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. 
So when Paul is talking about peace, when he talks about it, he's not talking about the relational concept, you know, peace between God and man. He's talking about an experience, something you feel. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, even though it is a singular word, it is used in the collective sense. And it, 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 it includes peace. Actually, Paul uses what's called three triads, or three groups of three. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so when Paul speaks of peace, he is referring to the experience that one has as a result of God's grace in their lives. Peace as a feeling within one's soul. Linsky, the, the commentator, says that the Greek word here refers, and I quote, to an assured quietness of the soul, the opposite of dread and terror, the feeling that all is well between themselves and God. Luke talks about the reality of the relationship. And Paul describes how that relationship feels. For example, have you ever had a fight or an argument with a family member, a spouse, a friend? You walk out angry, you slam the door, you say stuff. And then when you're by yourself, you, know, you review the fight in your mind. You think about the words, the nasty things that were said, what you should have said. And you know what happens after for many of us? You know that sick feeling you have in your stomach, the anger, the frustration, the sadness that that conflict has brought you? And then, out of nowhere, a day later, a couple of days later, you receive an email or a message or a call, an offer of reconciliation, perhaps even an apology. And you and the other person, you kind of talk things through and each person seeks forgiveness and renewal and old misunderstandings and bitter feelings melt away. We've all had that experience. My question is, do you remember how you feel after that reconciliation has been made? Do you remember how you feel? You feel light. You feel joyful. You feel more loving towards that person. You feel hopeful. You feel enthusiastic. I've always said that every good friendship has to have some fights. Your best friend doesn't become your best friend unless you've had some knockdown, drag out fights with your best friend and then reconciled with your best friend. That's what makes a best friend, whether it's a spouse or you know, whatever. And all these feelings together that you feel produce this thing that the Bible calls peace. Peace that replaces the feelings that you had before. Now earlier in Galatians 5.19, Paul is talking about the kinds of feelings that the flesh, or rather the works of the sinful flesh produce. He says, this is what the sinful flesh produces, jealousy. Well, jealousy is a feeling. Envy, that's a feeling. Anger, that's a feeling. Disputes, divisions, sexual impure desires, and so on and so forth. And then he says, in contrast to these, he says, the feelings produced by the Holy Spirit, they are easily recognizable. In other words, it's easy to see when you're in the flesh or when you're in the spirit. Because when you're in the flesh, you don't feel good. But when you're truly in the spirit, you feel at peace. Now he doesn't explain in great detail how to cultivate peace. It is something that the Holy Spirit actually cultivates in you. So that brings me to the last part of my, of my lesson uh, this morning. What is the relationship between the Holy Spirit and peace. We've talked about peace achieved by the cross of Christ, you know, that relational peace between man and God. And we've also talked about the feeling of peace that Paul talks about in Galatians. Well, the Holy Spirit in Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the peace that the birth of Christ announced was announced and orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. 
if you're saying to me, what's the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Christmas and the peace that comes because of that? The Holy Spirit is the one that orchestrated everything that took place to bring Jesus to the earth. You see, in God's plan to save man, each member of the Godhead had a role to play as revealed by the scriptures. The plan of salvation, of course, and I've mentioned this before, allow me to digress, okay? Let me open up a little window here. The plan of salvation is not, I hear the gospel, I believe the gospel, I confess my faith, I'm, I repent, I baptize. That's not the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is that God decided to send Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the sins of men. That's the plan to save man that I hear the gospel, that I confess Christ, repent, that I'm baptized, that is man's response to the plan of salvation. We need to get these two ideas you know, in the proper context so they, they snap together. And so in God's plan to save man, each member of the Godhead had a role to play, as I've mentioned. The Father, for example, conceived the plan and sent the Son. John 5.36 says, the works which the Father has given me to accomplish. Jesus understood that the Father is the one that originated the plan and sent the Son. The role of the Son was that He accomplished the plan. He died for the sins of men. In John 19.30, when Jesus on the cross says, it is finished, what is finished? The plan is finished. And then the Holy Spirit, what's His role? The Holy Spirit provided many elements to make sure the plan would be completed. For example, the power to sustain the Jewish people, the power to give utterance to all the prophets. The individual or the spirit is the one that enabled Mary to conceive uh, miraculously, enable the miracles to be made, and so on and so forth. Without the Holy Spirit's part, there would be no Christmas, no birth of Jesus, no anticipation of the peace that Jesus would ultimately achieve between man and God. In other words, what's the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Christmas? The Holy Spirit is the one who maintained all of the elements, both spiritual and physical, that permitted Jesus to be born and carry out the Father's plan for peace. That's the role of the Holy Spirit with Christmas. And then let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit and how that works into what we're talking about, how we're talking about this morning. You see, once Jesus accomplished the Father's plan for peace and returned to the Father in heaven after His resurrection, what did He promise? He promised to send the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verse 25, says the following. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And what was the Holy Spirit going to do? He was going to maintain the peace that Jesus created at His cross. Jesus creates the peace. The Holy Spirit helps us to internalize that peace so that we can feel it, so that it can work to build us up in Christ. And how was He going to do this? Three ways, and then the lesson is yours. First of all, He would help. He would comfort and help the sinner by giving him spiritual power, enabling him in his prayer life, empowering him to overcome sin, reassuring him that, the, that he really belonged to God, raising his body from the dead. Paul talks about all these helps that the Spirit would do in Romans 8, 9 to 17. This help that the Spirit would give would not allow sin to frighten or disturb the peace that exists between God and man. You want to know what takes your peace away, brothers, sisters? Sin. 
Sin is what takes your peace away. You have peace and then you sin and your peace goes away. And your peace only comes back when you acknowledge the sin and ask God to forgive you and restore you. We keep moving back and forth. We don't, as Christians, we don't move back and forth, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved. I mean, who wants to live like that? No, no, we keep, we keep moving back and forth from peace to stress, from peace to fear, from peace to you know, another negative feeling. The biggest reason to really make an effort to overcome the temptations in the world is that you do not want to lose the peace that you have that has been so hard won for you and I through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Another way that the Spirit was going to help maintain and cultivate this peace in us, He would teach us at first he empowered the apostles to do miracles, to confirm the word and provided them with an exact memory of all the teachings of Christ. Those teachings were recorded and preserved so that all men in every generation could find and secure for themselves the peace that they yearned for with God through Christ. And then finally, the Spirit would remain. The Holy Spirit is the embodiment of peace and He is given to every believer at baptism, Acts 2, 38. How else would Jesus' peace remain in a dynamic and living form throughout the centuries? You know, men, they signed peace treaties. You think those are any good? Read the history of World War II and all the peace treaties that Germany signed with all of its neighbors. You'll find out what good a peace treaty is. Or maybe American uh, uh, Native Americans, you know, talk to them about peace treaties. And so, you know, men sign peace treaties all the time. But the peace treaty that God signs with us is signed in the blood of Jesus. He never goes back on that. Maybe we do, but He never goes back on the treaty. When Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, he's referring to the work that the Spirit accomplishes in the Christian through his help and teaching and presence in his soul. Yes, peace is a feeling, but it is a feeling produced as one willingly and faithfully accepts the help, the teaching, and the leading of the Holy Spirit in one's life. <coughs> so let's draw a couple of practical lessons from what I've shared with you this morning, and then we'll be done. Lesson number one, make sure the good feeling that you have at Christmas is not just based on having your shopping done. I mean, that is a good feeling. I know, because you know, I'm a task-oriented, object-motivated A-type guy. You know, I want to get things done, my to-do list. You know. So yeah, there's a good feeling you know, when I got my to-do list. But you know, for people like me, you know what the problem is? There's always another to-do list to do, right? Unless we have confessed Christ and repented of our sins and been baptized into His name, the peace that we feel at Christmas will be gone as soon as we have to go back to work. The Lord offers a lasting peace, a peace to our dying moment for those who believe and obey the gospel of Jesus. I want to tell you a, a bit of a funny story, <coughs> excuse me again, about Robert George. You know, uh, brother, uh, who's making you know, uh, brother uh, Bobby, uh, Bob was talking about the prayer list, you know, and he says, brother George, you know, he has cancer, brain cancer. I don't know if you know, but you don't come back from brain cancer. And yet he says, but his spirits, his spirit is high. His spirits are good. And yes, I, I, I saw him at the hospital Friday and he was talking and going back and forth and his old self, you know, old mess. And I said to him, you know, I'm the minister, I'm there, you know, and we chit chatted and visited for a while. And I said, Robert, I said, well, let's have a prayer, shall we? He says, oh, thank you, yes, of course. And he takes my hand and proceeded to pray for me. <laughs> I guess the preacher in him, you know, never dies. 
why do you think he did that? He did that because the peace of the spirit cannot be defeated by cancer. That's why he did that. The Lord offers a lasting peace, a peace to your dying moment if you are one of those who are blessed because you have believed, repented, been baptized and continued faithfully in the Lord. Amen. Lesson number two, let the Holy Spirit work in you, please. Paul says that the true sons of God are those who are being led by the Holy Spirit. The fruit that he talks about in Galatians, these are not things that you produce, these are things that he has been sent to produce in you. Paul merely lists them so you can discern who is the master of your soul. Who is leading you? Ask yourself, who am I being led by? Am I being led by the Spirit? Because if I am, I'm producing peace and joy and love and faith and self-control and all these things are, are, are coming out of me. Why? Because I'm being led by the Spirit and if I'm being led by the flesh it'll be evident. Why? Because I'll be, I'll, uh, there'll be division and chaos and anger and, and, and sexual impurity and so on. Those things will be evident to everybody, especially me. So yes, let the Spirit comfort you and encourage you and teach you, but most of all, let Him lead you and lead your steps in Christ. And I guarantee you, you will know peace. And in knowing peace, you will know Him who is the Prince of Peace. And then finally, I encourage every one of you here and those of you who are watching online, make peace at all costs. Make peace at all costs. God gave His only Son to make peace with us. Surely we can give up our pride and stubbornness to make peace with those who are alienated from us. And so if you need God's peace, if you need the strength to make peace, then we encourage you to come. Come to the Prince of Peace, born in Bethlehem so long ago, who waits for you to make peace with the Father, or to help you make peace with a brother, a sister, or someone else. Will you not consider that now, as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement?